Alrighty guys, in this video I'm gonna talk about how I let a $15,000 trade turn into a $3,000 loser because this caught a lot of attention in the trading community and um, I know this is gonna flush some fucking people out of the woodworks. First and foremost, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna explain why I was in that trade, why I let it come back, the contextual cues. I stood to make 40,000 on it. I didn't scale anything out. I'm gonna explain every reason why I did what I did and what happened, okay? And, and that, you know what's funny is you fucking people, you guys, somebody's gonna do it here. It's already been happening. Somebody's gonna come out of the war woodworks and said, you should have fucking scaled it. You should have cut it. You should have did this. You should never let it come back. You know what that's like saying? That's like telling somebody, you're, maybe your friend's in a toxic relationship with uh, some piece of shit, and you're telling them, hey, you need to get out of that relationship. You need to get out of that relationship. It's easy for you guys, as traders, to tell other people what to fucking do, and even as humans. But the moment you're in the fucking situation... Because I know you've all made mistakes. I know you've all done really stupid shit many fucking times. Now, I don't think what I did was necessarily stupid. Was, was there mistakes made? Yes. Was there a massive learning curve? Uh, uh, a massive amount of experience gained from it? Yes. And I'm, again, I'm going to explain that. But the moment you guys are in that toxic relationship and your friends are telling you, you need to get out of it, you don't. So... Keep that in mind because I know somebody's going to say something. All right? And for those of you who want to say something, I don't give a fuck. Okay? I really don't give a fuck. I remember there was one video where I talked about leaving a big trade on the table. And it came all the way back. And some guy said, I should unsubscribe to you for letting a trade come back. But lucky for you, I'm not going to. Because I want to hear what you have to say. Like, you're doing me a fucking favor. You know what? You ain't doing me a fucking favor. Get the fuck out of here. It's time to purge the, the channel a little bit with the get the fucks out of here. I don't give a fuck. Listen, I know who the fans are. Those of you that come here and give me love, that's I do it for you guys. Those of you who enjoy this channel and you actually listen with an open mind and open heart instead of this closed-minded bullshit, some of these fucking people come here and do. Th those of you that are very close-minded, get the fuck out of here. Uh, I said it in the one of the Apteros videos. I'm going to say it again. Up top right there, there's an X. Go ahead and fucking click it. There we go. Hopefully they're fucking gone. Because I really don't give a shit, guys. Um, because trading is not easy. And there is a point in time... It's it just there's points and times where it's difficult. It never gets e it gets easier. I'll say that when you have a system and uh, and you know what you, but trading itself is difficult. It's never a point where, I mean, you're in the unknown. You're in a realm of uncertainty, and you're gonna hit periods of lulls. So I've said this in prior videos, and I'm gonna say it here. Um, hell, if you think giving 15000 back is bad, um, in the month of February, I left about 40000 on the table. In fact, I've said this in other videos, I've had an identity crisis for several years where I have the pedigree of a scalper, but I wanted to learn how to hold trades. And I've gotten tremendously better at it. I've got tremendously better at managing them because in the end trade management is that's everything that is everything trade management is like if you're playing fucking i don't know f american football or some shit and you got the ball in your hand okay how are you gonna fucking maneuver with that trade management is everything because when you're not in a trade nothing's happening the moment you put the trade on there's so much stuff you can do to manipulate the way you surf that shit. And it's uncertain because there is an element of luck in trading. 
It's skill and luck. Trading has an element of luck. There is no certainty. You have to think in probabilities. Okay? So, trade management is very difficult. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. There are times where you can grease it, but then there's times where you have problems, where you cut a little early and then it kept going, which actually happened to me yesterday. The trade finally set up, but I had to cut early because I had to fix some problems. So what I want to say is, um, in order for me to have actually gotten better at the skill of holding trades and not having paper hands, I've had to have a shitload of trades come back. And as trades come back, I'm gaining experience. Okay? If any of you are a scalper entertaining the idea of holding trades, you're going to have a shitload of trades come back. It's the nature of the beast. And if you trade the ESE minis, it is a fucking very choppy market. And trying to develop the developing the skill set of higher time frame analysis and aligning it, mushing it with everything else, uh, that takes time. Holding trades takes time. So every time a trade comes back, I'm gaining experience. That's what I got from this. I'm still a developing trader, guys. M the way to get good at trading is to get fucked up a lot. Learning what not to do by getting fucked up a lot is how you learn what to do, right? There's certain times where I'm like, I'm not trading this shit. I'm not trading this. It's not enough volatility or it's too choppy in this specific area or there's too much dissonance. This says long, this says short. A lot of the time where I'm not taking trades is because in the past I've gotten fucked up from trading that type of thing hundreds if not thousands of times and then throughout my trading career I learn because this is a skill I learn what not to do by getting fucked up experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted so if you think you're gonna just sit here and come in and piss excellence that's not reality so there you go guys I don't give a shit and I'm going to fucking tell you guys straight up. So if you guys want to throw flack my way, fuck you. That's fine with me. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of here. But those of you who want to learn and understand why this was such a good trade, what I was looking for, and and why it, why it failed and what happened, um... This is going to be a great learning lesson as far as building out narrative and context goes. Now, keep this in mind. When I, You guys don't understand the way I trade. The way I trade is very complex. The way I construct contextual queuing is pretty com complex. I have another video on it, um, the A-plus trade video. And then I also recommend the EV trade video. Go watch those two. Um... But I talk about how I construct trades and shit in those videos or calculating EV, which is very important. I'm looking for pressure points. So you're, if you know nothing about my trading, this might be very hard to comprehend. And as I'm showing you things on my charts, you, you might start looking at it from the perspective of your charts, your setups... And you're going to look at it from your uh, your lens, your lenses of the market. I need you guys to completely erase that and go into this with a blank mindset and understand it from my perspective, not yours. And just because all there, there's a million ways to trade the markets, we all see the markets in different perspectives and we can all be consistent, right? So just because you see something one way, and if you've not seen it, the Apteros Intensive Review, it's a playlist. You can go watch that. Marion and I see the market from different perspectives. Doesn't mean that we both can't be consistently profitable traders. 
Okay? So, and those traders that I think give out a lot of flack for, you know, leaving $15,000 on the tray uh, on the table or saying it it was supposed to go down here. It no, it it probably could. You should think in probabilities. It's never it could or I mean it should do this. It could. All right. Or it should, but you got to always have this element of it just might not. And traders that are forcing opinions on it, it needs a dump or you should have never done this. That to me shows a lack of trader maturity. I'm over here putting up the fucking fingers and shit. But, you know, I'm a bit wild. But that shows a lack of trader maturity as far as understanding the game. Understanding why other traders do what they fucking do. Because obviously Fat Cat has some very deep intellectual intellectual and intelligent conversations with you. I never shit on anybody else's trading style or system or their mistakes because I understand. I understand what this is for what it is. So let's get into it. So we need to start at the highest of time frames. And let me bump out a macro pad real quick. Okay, so this was the $15,000 give back was on Wednesday. Okay, so what you guys need to understand is this is the oldest edge in the book for me. This is a, a setup that it just it has a shitload of edge for me. If you guys attempt to try to trade it, you're going to get fucked up. Okay, but on the right is a three-year profile. Notice this section here. Notice how low noted this section is, okay? As you can see, there, there looks to be about a curve here. And then up here is another curve, okay? So this is my highest time frame on the right. Because I use profiles on multiple time frames. This gap section right here, when I have a gap... There's a point in time where the market just shoves and goes all the way through it. This gap actually happened to be really large. Not all of them are this large. This gap was over 254 ticks uh, wide. So that's a massive gap. They're not usually this big. Okay, so I don't have that much experience with a gap of this magnitude. There was another time when 4,000 first, the price 4,000, it first got hit. We went through 4,000, never came back. And it created this gap effect on the three year. And I, same problem I had this go, I had with that. It was a massive gap worth hundreds of ticks. And then um, tried getting into it for a big hold. It just, I got beat up. So I've not traded I don't have much experience. Huh? I don't have much experience with this setup of this size. And the larger they are, the more teething issues you're going to have with them. It's no different than trading a massive composite. Or maybe you're looking at support and resistance on just a daily candlestick chart. If you try to trade support and resistance on a daily chart... Um, it's not that simple because it could spend a full day, two days, even a week chopping that support and resistance level. And it could be going through it, you know, 10, 20, 30 points. But on a daily chart, that doesn't look like much. So trying to trade higher time framed, more massive setups. <clears throat> it's important to go down the smaller time frames to try to finesse your way into it. Higher time frame shit, bigger holds, they just have their own set of issues from my experience, okay? Especially if you're somebody like me who is more of a tighter trader. I'm, for the most part, not never risking more than 12 ticks to get into a trade. You guys have seen my MAE. It's relatively tight. Um, generally, I... My trade, my average MAE is going to be sub six ticks. So 
when it comes to getting into s trades of that magnitude, sure, some of you are like, well, you could just widen your stop. That doesn't necessarily work out because the way I analyze markets is there's a b bunch of areas where there could be potential pivots and shit. And the, the ES is so brutally choppy that it does some fucked up shit where um, the expected value is constantly shifting and there could be problems. So and they're just, for me, it's not worth putting on that much risk. <coughs> now I will swing shit with option contracts at times. So let's kind of continue to talk uh, about this. So now we know the setup. Now, leading into the setup, okay, there's a lot going for it. So down here is a major point of control. This is the point of control for the last three fucking years. And again, if you watch the uh, intensives, I talk about how I, in that intensive, I think it's going to go up and not come back from that point, at least for a while. Um... So what happened is we spent a lot of time down here. Notice how this high node had rotated. And again, this is a 120 minute chart. So these are big bars. You got a lot of rotation um, in this section. So it made sense they were going to push it up to this point. Now, once it got up to this point, I wasn't sure if it would roll or whatnot. Because you also kind of have this going on here. Which this alone is going to cause a little bit of drama. For the trade to actually go through that gap section that I'm looking at. <clears throat> so when we go back. Notice this. This is from. Uh, this curve up here is going to be from. Um, you know February. Early February. Super late January. But notice the way the curve is shaped. The, the curve for the most part, has that good bell curve look. It looks like a bell curve. It's not all fucking janky and shit. But the thing is, since it's such an extraordinarily high time frame curve that spans over many fucking days, all the way up to, um, I believe, the 17th or something. Yeah, about the 16th. So about a half of a month. Um, it's a relatively good-looking curve for such a high time frame deal. Um, obviously I want to cut it up in the smaller sections, smaller curves, but also I love the price action on it. So for me, curves aren't the only thing. It's also the price action and the price action did a lot of whipsaw movement and, um, bell curves can be constructed on different types of price action. This is my favorite type. I'm not going to explain it all here when I sell a course that's where I would explain it uh, more. But it's also, it's spent a lot of time chopping in this gap section. And if you take this composite, it kind of meshes inside that gap section. Gap section. So for me, there's a good chance that it'll go through all the way. Because I've been, this is my first, this is one of my first playbook setups. Where I gained edge and gained consistency. There's another one that I don't really use that often called a Z-top. That's pretty old school, but the gap has worked for years <coughs> and years. And guys, I'm not going to answer a shitload of questions about this stuff. So uh, again, I'm, you know, why did you do this? Why, why is this like that? Why is the gap? It's just statistically I've been tracking this for a very long time. Now, clearly, it chopped like fucking hell. So, obviously, you can get fucked up. So, for me, right in here was a real threshold price up in these uh, 27s. Just somewhere in this region between 33s and 24s. I'm really looking to get along into this. But, as you can see, it got abused. Now, here's the deal. It ran almost the entire gap. At one point, it almost ran the entire gap. And then it came down. And 
in this section, this is a, looks like a curve to me. Now, for me, I mean, it looks like a curve, so it is a curve. It just has a very janky top where it's pushed in. I call those volcano tops when you have a curve, but it's not peaky. When it's pushed in, it's a volcano top. So that's going to lead to some weird price action. So as you can see, it almost went across the gap. For me, a gap of this magnitude, I want to see a, a half roll. So it half rolled. It almost, it went either halfway or a little more than halfway and then pivoted in. When I see that, typically a larger gap is good to go for the jump across. So there's some context for you. But also this curve up here, this curve up here is relatively good looking, okay? So the value zone low is this green line. The value zone high is up here. Well, this curve, that price action had gone all the way to the midpoint of this composite and rolled. So that is an extra level of contextual cueing to make the narrative that much better. So not only am I trying, because the thing with auction market theory is there's going to be multiple auction processes happening at the same time, but different curves and different pieces of structure are in different cycles or different life stages of the auction process. So I'm looking for a complete auction. So we're starting to bang into this massive composite from early February we're not quite accepting it yet, but also it, that massive composite should create a gravitational force that'll help assist the price action through this gap on the three-year profile. Okay. And guys, if I'm giving away a lot here, this is very juicy shit. Just saying, please consider donating to my coffee because I don't charge for anything. I don't make sh jack fucking shit for YouTube. Um, guys, this is how atrocious the ad revenue for fucking YouTube is. So I put in a lot of work, a lot of time. This video alone is going to take me, you know, probably over an hour to tell you what's going on. Took me 30 minutes to set up the studio, two hours to edit, then in another hour making thumbnails and all that shit for nothing okay so guys if you like this high quality content please again consider donating to coffee because when you guys donate it just this is fucking atrocious this is why eventually i'm gonna sell shit because it makes making content worth it this is a whole nother fucking job i don't have to do this but i'm sure you guys would like me to continue to do it i like doing it it's another fucking job okay so but you gave back $15,000. Excuse me, I'm explaining. Okay, so the price action comes in. So this curve starts pulling. We have this really hard shove up right here. Okay, in fact, we have such a massive run um, for fucking many days that it's like, okay, at some point this does need a pullback. So we start getting the pullback over the course of several days in this section. Ideally, I would have liked to see it hit that pocket, but it didn't. It did something called a bottom tick, which is really good to see. Um, and then it comes up in this section, and then it starts getting pulled in. But now what we're starting to see is it kind of is starting to move up. And then what I could do is... Um, let me actually de delete a lot of this shit. Now what I can start doing now to further refine the trade is start cu cutting up this curve. There's a curve here. There's a curve there. There's a small piece of shit curve there. There's one here. This is a bit janky. So I can start cutting up this larger curve. Also, this is about, this rotation is about the midpoint of this curve here. So if we go ahead and look at that pivot, remember that we got a, a mid pivot up top. If we come down here, we kind of go from this low node to roughly about here. That's pretty close to the mid pivot. It's never perfect on higher time frames, but you know, it is what it is. 
So here's, here's, again, this is, I've not done, I have not, I don't see 200 tick gaps frequently. These trades come around very, very, very rarely. This is, I stood to make 30 to 40 grand on it. Now, here's the thing. When it was cycling in this section, there were days where I was trying to get into it, 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 all last week and earlier this week, based off of the price action. And most of the trades just kept coming back. But I knew what the upside potential could be. I'm like, that's fine, that's fine. We're taking minimal damage, we're fixing some losses. I ended up being down th over three grand last week. And then we started to get into it. Um, I believe right, right here. And we were holding, a, there was many times where I was holding the position overnight and it just wasn't working. Actually, I remember this one. I think it went to the 40s, yeah. <clears throat> For me, this I got in on this specific day, the 7th. For me, it was ready to go. I had to hold it in the overnight. It made sense. It should at least get a lot higher. And then it, it came back. It came back, and I got wicked out in the overnight position because I was setting up a lot of stops and targets and shit. And so I took all of it but two contracts off because it was 12 lots, I took all but two off. Um, and I, I simply can't monitor this shit 24 hours. So I have to set a bunch of shit up for it to get me out if things go wrong or take profits. But for me at this point, it's good to go based off of uh, all this higher time frame shit. <coughs> and also this wicking down here is the low of this composite. So that's another piece of contextual cue to actually be getting long. So I remember it came back. 10 of the 12 lots came out for a tick. Left a shitload of money on the table. And then it adjusted to where I had two contracts on at a 24 tick stop. And it literally worked. Um, I don't remember if it was this specific day. But there was another day where that happened to me. Um, it might have been over here. So, just a lot of teething problems over the last, the last week and earlier this week. So, let's go to a 10-minute chart. Okay, so this is the price action and this is what the profile of the more recent price action because on the 120, the, again, that curve up there is, you know, early... Uh, February, um, this more recent price action right here, this is current. So this is a current composite. So I'm cutting up the curves on the 120 minute, which there's a curve here. Um, and then there was another one down here as well, which I cut up. I don't think I had it drawn out, um, well, I did, but I just, let's see here. Yeah, let me draw it. Okay, so what you're seeing here, there's a curve here, and there's a curve here on the major composite. Those are going to be marked out by the red. Since this is now a 10-minute chart, we got more noise, but now we have a cur current area. Notice how, like, this curve marked by the green box and this upper curve marked by the green box. Notice how they're racked, askewed, misaligned. So you're going to get a lot of pivoting, a lot of ch chopping from the way I see things. Not to mention you have the <clears throat> three-year curve here. <clears throat> so I'm carefully keeping track of pressure points and the way things are ping-ponging because for me, my edge is in tracking pressure points. Um... At least that's how I find high expected value trades. So Wednesday is going to be uh, up in this section. So 
I had looked at this and I had did a major write up on that Tuesday, and I'm like, you know, this gap is still 200 tick, 250 ticks wide or what have you. Really, I'm looking for 88s to get out. Um, what I think FOMC, if if the trade is heavily in my favor when the FOMC releases, it should push the price in my favor. I'll talk more about FOMC here in a moment. <coughs> but we had spent a lot of time down here on this lower curve. We came in there, chopped it, came out, accepted this upper one came in the green boxes, came down. Now we're up, we're accepting. And now we're racking around. So we're starting to accept this composite curve, which actually aligns with uh, this upper curve that's not green. Um, or I could potentially be looking to maybe get in right here. It's just like, it, it's. I know it probably is fucking with your eyes, but the way it's accepting and ping-ponging, I don't want to spend too much time on that shit. But for me, it's like, okay, we're also accepting in the gap. So the gap, again, is right here. So we are chopping here. We are chopping up here. We have the pressure point up here. We have a hard down flush. Typically, a down flush reclaims. So anytime you see a CPI or FOMC, there you go, FOMC, they take it back. Any hard move in the ES typically gets taken back. I call that reclaiming. <clears throat> so I had a bit of reclaim on the left to help assist the trade. So let's zoom in. So it comes down to this point. I start getting long in this section. So obviously we push up really hard. Now this is what kind of gets me. This is where I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. It top ticks right here. But we have a shitload of reclaim right there. So for me, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm not sure. There's a bit of dissonance because of the top tick. But I have more cards in my favor for long than short. So as we come down here, we're, we're smacking off. Th this is such a key area. Okay. Again, let me bring this over here. Again, this is the 120 minute curve. One of the curves. Okay. So this is the midpoint. We could get a mid pivot off that curve. This also happens to be the low node on between two major curves right behind me. So not only is it a midpoint, but if you look right here where the two green boxes sort of separate, that's two low nodes separating. Also, where this is the most major low node separating this curve on the three year, but also what I can do is cut this curve up right here and look at it from this perspective. And it's like, okay, this has, based off this other price action too, this to me was a stop run that needed to happen. Notice how this price action looks over here. See how it kind of like chops its way up? That specific day, we spent the entire day going up and stair-stepping up. The next day, same thing happened. Okay, because you got some overnight session. The next day, they stair-stepped it up again. So we had two days of stair-stepping. So typically, when the market really channels upwards, that gets flushed hard, usually, because that's like a lot of stop runs. When the market is stair-stepping up or stair-stepping down, it's not a smooth push. So more and more people are trying to shove it down but one side is obviously winning, but the other side keeps trying to shove it down, shove it down, but it just keeps grinding up. Typically, there's a shitload of stop runs in those areas, and then what do they do? They get fucking puked. So th this, to me, was getting flushed and puked. I actually took a really good short in here uh, at some point. I'm not going to explain that. But what it did was it built up some P&L for me to gear up for the long, and I cut it because... <coughs> Am I, um, in my prep before the session, I was speculating many scenarios. One of them was coming into the 20s and rotating. Based off everything I shared with you, this is the, this place has multiple factors of support. We have a fuckload of acceptance above us. So most of the chopping is above us that 
120 minute composite should pull it. Um, this actually, that one push again, almost hitting target, not quite. So for me, that's another mid pivot, which is really good. And if we really look at it, most of this range in this section is within this gap section. And there's a good chance that this profile over here should help assist it. And I've talked about it, I think in the A plus trade video or the EV video, <coughs> it might've been the A plus one, but I talked about how a mid pivot and once it's set up twice, um, then I knew the trade was on for that specific setup. You need, you guys need to go watch that video. Same concept, same fucking concept. So for me, like everything is like, okay, this is it. This is it. This is it. This is probably the final time. It's probably ready to go. And I think I can get overshoot and get more than 88s out of it, but I'm going to be really <coughs> aggressive at cutting on 88s. Okay guys. So next we want to kind of dive in and look at the intraday. Where was the execution on a smaller time frame? So this would be on the 12th. So we're going to go to the 12th. So here's the 12th. Here's the flush. Uh, right here. This is uh, when I started getting into it. You can see a lot of the lines. Obviously, it's a lot more zoomed in. So let me actually put a profile down. Okay, so here's the open of the session. Here's the high of the session right up in that section. Okay. Notice we don't get up there again and then we flush, okay? And we flush hard. Remember, I'm really looking in this spot. I don't really ever want to catch a knife. Um, so I started gearing up when I noticed it to start to rotate up in this section. I believe I was in at 27s if I'm not mistaken. So once it started pulling back up, I started gearing up to get into the trade um, because, well, here's why. Notice this low node and this low node match the three year and the intraday. There's a perfect curve here. They match. So for me, it's like there's a good chance it could come in. But also there's some three second stuff happening that I'm not showing, but it's the way it's pivoting and rotating up in this section on a three second that also cued me off. So I'm like, at this point, it's good to potentially go. So we're getting in and we grease it perfectly no drama on it at all all 12 lots all at once so we're holding it and we're holding it and then it comes up here we obviously consolidate at this section and then fomc is going to be released at this section where it's very choppy but at this point notice how close we are to the high of day the highs the high of day is in this section. Hell, the high of this pullback is here. We're so close to high a day, and we've came so far that for me, it makes sense that maybe the trade doesn't go all the way to target, but it makes sense to me that we should at least hit the high of day. Also, when FOMC releases, which again, it did it so far in my favor. So I'm like, okay, I can sit through this volatility because this is what you could see how it's more choppy there. For me, it's like, okay, FOMC, what it'll often do, the book thins out, it goes nuts. And for the last, I don't know how many FOMCs, a shitload of them, the market would move really hard in one direction at some point fake everybody out and then pivot and shoot off the other way. So that was my expectation because FOMC kept doing that. This would also give me the boost to target. Also, the high of day is so close. It makes sense that we should at least top tick or test it. Hence the reason I'm holding the motherfucker. So it's chopping here. What was interesting is <clears throat> it wasn't that aggressive. And then it got aggressive, 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 aggressive. And then it comes to my entry. I start cutting. But what it started doing here was it started ranging above my entry. So I kept re-entering here. So right in this section, because I like fading means, I have a range. 
and then I have a curve. Okay, let's drag this off because the curve over here was different, right? Right here was a little goofy. It was getting goofier. But it kind of aligns a little bit. So I'm like, at some point I got patient. I waited. Tried getting into it several times and also this is a hard flush what did i say about hard flushes most of the time they get taken back and also we're starting to put in a range so at this point i'm like you know this could this range could stop the move because in order to stop a large down move you typically get ranging so it's like it, they should hit this reclaim they should hit this reclaim a lot of fomcs will take all that move back we sh high of day was on deck. It didn't happen. The things that were really having me want to attempt to hold the trade just weren't fucking happening. This range was enough, in my opinion, to stop the move. What did it do? It flushed. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I carefully start tracking it. It hits this dotted line, which is a low note on the 120. And then it starts coming up. Let me extend this. The problem was we were getting a little too close at the end of the day. So it starts coming in. I'm carefully tracking pressure points in, in this section, which, again, that's very minute, very labor intensive. Um... I'm really tracking structure in this section. I'm looking at it from this perspective. 20 kept getting rotated. I'm like, okay, there's stop runs on 20. So I start doing... Um, so at, at some point, I just gave up, right? Up here, I gave up. I'm like, well, I guess the trade didn't work. But I also was telling traders I'm mentally prepared to give the 15000 back. I'm okay if it comes back. That's fine. I'm willing to fight it. It doesn't matter to me. So it didn't fuck with me. Because again, I stood to make over $40,000 on the trade on the upside. And based off of a lot of what I'm telling you, again, scrub your mind clean from my system, the way I trade, everything made sense the way prior FOMC's trade being so close to high a day. It, the probability of it working was so fucking high. But every little thing that could potentially go wrong did. Again, a high probability trade isn't a guarantee. And I would, will take this trade and do what I did every fucking time. Because I know this setup. I know that obviously this one's a lot bigger. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So right in this section, I start adding size slowly. I start adding. So I do dynamic betting. So what I'm doing is... I think it'll go up, but I don't want to risk too much. I had cash flow to play with. So I start adding two at a time, four, then I hit an eight. And then it comes up in that low node, and I'm like, it could roll here. It could roll here. <clears throat> and I was telling other traders, if it comes back, I'm going to pull everything for a tick and leave two on with a 24 tick stop. Unfortunately, we were getting really close to the day. And what happened? Somebody just jammed a fuckload of blocks and swept the fucking piss out of the market. It went way past me so quickly, I couldn't pull off anything. And ideally, I wanted a... When it was chopping in this section, I wanted a pullback to 16 and I was going to get long 16s. And again, it's a hard push. Since it's such a hard push, typically they reclaim it back. So I was going to use that opportunity to start cutting shit off for a lot less of a loss. But it went in the 16 and embedded in 16. I was in full size. I held it and then it just stayed in here. And then the way it started banging around again, this was about 250. I noticed 250 was coming up on the clock. I'm like, dude, I'm going to get fucked. 
And it's spent quite a bit of time chopping here. It doesn't seem like it spent much time there, but on the three second, it, it should have been bouncing in the way it was like banging around in here. I'm like, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. So I flat keyed out of it. Fucking took a $3,000 loss pretty much. It was in the day. I'm like, well, I got fucked right out the end. It, it could have been, you know, losing three grand to nothing really about 600 bucks on the um two lots had i ha had it but it just went so far many fucking ticks um i knew they could pivot it there but somebody just block dropped swept it hard didn't reclaim again typically it reclaims that didn't happen um so i got whacked and for me, it's like, this is no longer the trade. The trade's no longer here because of how it's pivoting. So at this point, I ha I'm in, I'm down 7,500. That includes the prior week and the week, this week. So I had a long discussion with another trader. I'm like, <clears throat> I should never fought for it the way I did in the prior, um, week when it was first getting into the gap even though i thought it could be setting up even though it got the mid pivot it's such a colossal gap i don't have many i've not traded many of them of this magnitude and this reminds me of the one around four thousand. i don't know how long ago so what i decide i'm i'm, I'm like i'm just gonna start cash flowing the fuck out of it because i left more than 15 grand on the table really i've probably left 40 50 thousand total in the last two weeks on the table um but i'm learning i'm learning uh because holds on aren't that easy <clears throat> especially in a choppy market like this so the lesson is to start just be more aggressive on scaling where I fucked up on this specific day because it made sense it was good to go on this day. 100%. The only thing I should have done different was take off a bunch of size when I was up. It was more than 15 grand, by the way. It was probably closer to 18. Um, but I should have took a bunch off to pay for that $3,000 loss from the prior week. And then just let the rest ride. Because if you've seen my bankroll management video, I talk about fixing losses and paying for losses in that specific video. I didn't do that. I should have fixed the prior week. I'm good at fixing intraday losses, but it just slipped my mind to um, not fix last week's loss. Um, and, you know, at the time, again, at the time, I was pretty sure this range would snap the price back in. Uh, when I was fighting down here, uh, it just everything made sense. I have statistics on all this shit, and most of the time, when certain things are aligned or set up in specific ways, it rolls and goes. None of the things did. So I'm like, I told him, no matter what happens on Thursday, I will, my trading buddy, I told him, no matter what happens on Thursday, I'm just going to spend time fixing the loss. I'm not going to be swinging for the fence. What does it fucking do? On Thursday, what does it do? It goes. And then had I held it in the overnight, it would have hit the 88 target. It hit 89. And you know what else happened? I got in full size, uh, I believe, in this region right here to the point where I could have just kept holding it. But it got kind of weird in this spot. So I decided to pull the whole, off, whole deal off and I locked in about three grand or something because I had a stop out prior to that. Um... And I'm like, I need to start digging out of this $7,500 hole. After commissions, I managed to be up like $4,400 on this specific day. And then come today, 
again it hit target a bit early i guess it made sense on the day that i hit it that it was so high probability i just had a full house in my hands uh and it just didn't work today i managed to fix the problems so now as of two weeks i've not really made money other than today now i'm officially out of the hole and i'm up like a little over 800 bucks so for those of you who ask how much can you average per week or day there is none but i it was the there's a lot of again a lot of learning lessons a lot of things that i might be forgetting or not mentioning in this but the way I constructed that trade for my system and style and the way things normally happen on an FOMC and how we're already close to the high of day, it makes sense it should tap it. And the way all these other things like higher time frame shit is pivoting near my entry, it all made sense to fucking that this is going to work. And then the hard sell off should have got reclaimed. It shouldn't never kept pushing. And then I had a range that should assist it back up didn't pan out that way didn't pan out that way the only there is no regrets the only thing that slightly upset me was when i got block dropped but the way i was finessing and getting into entries was very calm very precise i did everything right just had the Again, trading is skill and luck, and luck just was not there that day. Everything that... There was so many little things, a shitload of little things, that should have made the trade work for me, and each one of those kept failing. And that's sometimes when you flip the coin, it lands on tails ten times in a row. And that's what happened. The only thing I should have done was scale out $3,000 worth to fix, which I could have probably done on just two lots or whatever, to fix um, the prior week's loss, but that slipped my mind. Other than that, I don't regret any of it. I was prepared for it. It didn't fuck with me. Just wasn't happy with how the end of day ended. But I decided, you know, it doesn't matter. I did what I did. It happened the way it did. And it's easy for you guys to tell a trader what the fucking do. But you're never going to get good at holding unless you experience a lot of holds coming back. Because it, trade management is the hardest part. I've learned so much about holding by letting shit come back. <coughs> Again... The way you get good at this is experience and experience is what you get when you didn't get what you want. So that means you're going to get fucked up a lot or have a lot of failures before you learn how to do this shit. So I know it's easy for you guys to tell me I should have did this or that. But based off of, and I, I, I said, because I posted this, posted this on Twitter, I said I could spend an hour explaining why I did what I did, why it was good and why I let the trade come back and why I tried getting back in. And here you go. Here is a detailed explanation of all these components, how everything was there, how everything was green-lighted, how this was the best fucking hand I could possibly have, and it didn't work. But guess what? I learned from this, and I'm going to hit a $40,000 trade, and you guys are going to fucking hear about it. Hopefully I record it. Um, and see it. But it's going to fucking happen. So though, for those of you, it's easy to give shit. But based off my system, it, it was all there. It had a very high probability. Not certainty. Not guaranteed. Very high probability of working. But there's that little area where it just might not. I will take this trade all day long, every day. Because this trade works most of the time. I have stats on it. This one just happened to be a gap of the largest of magnitudes. And they have teething issues. But I've also seen 100 tick gaps rip a lot quicker than this one. So, 
I learned a lot. Um, and some of my biggest fuck-ups have made me the most amount of money. I remember there was this one Friday where I hit a drawdown of like two grand. This was maybe a year and a half ago. And I spent six hours reviewing that day. And I learned an insane phenomenon that I still use to this day that has made me all the money. It has been now incorporated into my trading system because I learned this one little thing from that fuck up. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we're out of the hole. It didn't bother me none, but it goes to show you how short trading days are. I've literally not made shit and you just, there is no average. This is why you don't blow money. This is why you don't spend money because times like this happen. When you hit consistency, you don't, it's just not, you don't win every day. You don't win every week. There's going to be problems. That's the reality of this game. But mentally being able to handle it takes a lot of seat time, a lot of experience. Because most of you would freak the fuck out on a $15,000 deal and fuck it all up. I had a trader said that if anybody else had gave back fifteen grand like I did, they would fuck the whole day trying to revenge trade their way back to that. Because humans naturally fight harder for something they lost than, than something they don't have. We tend to psychologically, something in most of us, we try to fight harder for shit we lost, and I didn't let it fuck with me at all. And that is the sign of trader maturity. So, and I was fine the next day. Not trying to get it all back. Not trying to get 7500 back. Whatever I get, I get. I only want to tra take good trades. Today, whatever I get, I get. If I had to spend the f next week trying to fix the problem, fuck it. I don't care. I just want to take good trades. I don't care about the money. Okay? I don't care. Yes, I, I do care, but I don't. For me, it's about the game playing the game and playing the game at a high level and taking good trades and pushing high probability setups as far as I can because of the contextual cues and the narrative. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that was informative. I hope you learned from that because a lot of people, this sent a huge rift through the community. A lot of attention was on it. Um, and welcome the trading. This is what it will become, not only for me, but for you guys too. Because you guys are going to fuck up. You guys are going to make fucking mistake. Every single one of you is going to make mistakes. I don't give a fuck. So again, easy to pass judgment onto another trader. But you guys are going to fuck up too. That's how it works. So I will see you guys in the next video.